Well, I knew we'd never get them all back together. But anyway, it's worth the journey. If you have opportunity today to find your Bibles with you, you'll find Matthew chapter 5, and uh, we'll be wrapping up our series on the Beatitudes today, and so I want to make sure we take an opportunity to do that. Before we actually get there, I need to introduce to you two of our most recent members of Northridge Church, Damien, actually, uh, when Jimmy Z sent me a picture initially, you know how the picture was? It was that baby in his arms. <laughs> and I wasn't sure whether he was really showing the baby off or showing himself off. You know, a proud pop at that moment. But anyway, bless the Lord for them and amen. What a, what a, what a beautiful baby boy. Let me introduce to you the second one that's happened here. This is sweet and his woman doing well. And so we're just excited to see what God's doing in the life of the Northridge family as he continues to bring some babies into our family. The rest of you all need to get busy. <laughs> Don't tell me it's impossible. Sarah was 90, remember that? Anyway, my, my, I, I've told you this, my father was 58 when I was born and went on when, uh, when we found opportunity a few... Well, <laughs> Just not too many years ago, when John Ross was born, my wife looked at me and she said, Honey, she said, You're now 58. Your daddy was 58. And she said, We could still happen, or it could still happen. <laughs> and I said, Yes, God's still on the throne. He still works miracles, but I'm not praying toward that end. But anyway, <laughs> I love grandbabies. But anyway, Hope you have your Bibles this morning. We're going to take an opportunity to wrap the, up this series today, and uh, if we can today. You know, we've been looking at the Beatitudes. This is number eight. This is the last of the Beatitudes that we have. And uh, let me just, if I can, revisit the ones that we have talked about thus far as we've talked about this life that God's seeking to develop in you and I, this godly life. And it all begins with that work on the inside of us. We all as followers of Christ who've grown up in church, maybe who didn't grow up in church, but live in a society where morality and those kind of things still has some sense of root, some sense of importance. Sometimes we sort of think if we can sort of fix ourselves or establish ourselves a certain set of norms that we can somehow or another attain to some sense of God being okay with us. The reality is, unless God does something on the inside of us, we will never be the men and women God destined us to be. It has to start there. It starts with us when we understand beatitude number one to be, for us to be poor in spirit, recognizing that before God I don't have what it takes, and that all my good that I could ever possibly have is all wrapped up in Him and in my relationship with Him. It moves us to a place when we understand that, to a place where we understand our own sin and the effects and the, and the damage and the vileness and the wickedness of our own sin. And that to, moves us to the place that we mourn over our sin, seeing the cost of it, moving us to a place where we, know, where we cease being sorry for sin, to a place that we're, we're, now we literally are, are choosing to transform or change our lives because of what the effect sin has had upon us. It moves us to beatitude number three, to a place where we meekly submit ourselves to the will of God, no matter what the cost. And when with that work on the inside of us, that root work, that, that work that oftentimes cannot be seen or tangibly touched, but that root work that's going on inside of us, there's no Christianity without these, but out of these roots comes a hunger and thirst for righteousness, beatitude number two, four, a deep longing uh, commitment of, of the soul of a godly life and there and where there's life that begins to be birthed and grown it will ultimately bear forth fruit and the next beatitudes is really the fruit that's born out of the work that's going on on the inside out of this root work out of this fruit bears forth a life that has a heart that's tender 
full of mercy, compassion, and forgiveness, a beautiful fruit ultimately that bears forth the resemblance of our Savior, the Lord Jesus. And out of this ultimately will come the purity of heart to, that, will, that, will will, that, that moves us to will one thing, to move beyond the spiritual stagnation of what it seems to be double-mindedness, a, a desire to be a part of the world as well as a part of Christ that moves us to the place that we're now single-mindedness, that we're committing ourselves wholly and fully to serving God. And out of this, then God brings us into an opportunity that where we can be peacemakers. A life that's not only at peace with God, but a life that's also able to be able to make peace among those around us. And here are the things that you and I are to cultivate so that God has called you and I to live a life that, that for us to pursue a pathway to sanctification, to growth in Christ, and ultimately where these blessings of life can be found. And then out of this life, comes this eighth beatitude. When I choose to commit my life wholly for God to develop the inside of me so that I might hunger and thirst for righteousness, that I might bear fruit out into this world, it ultimately brings me to a place where out of this whole piece brings me to the final beatitude starting in verse 10 of Matthew 5. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. The word persecuted literally means to be harassed, opposed, ill-treated. Jesus would say, if you pursue this kind of life to allow my spirit to transform your life, this is what will happen to you. You should expect it. You are blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and other all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great. For so they persecuted the prophets before you. Jesus said it should not, should not take us by surprise. We need to understand that when we open up the word of God, that not only do we find it in the life of Jesus, but we find it all throughout the rest of the Bible that persecution becomes the reality, the reality of the existence of those who have committed their life to Christ. The reason why it is, John, Jesus even tell us in John chapter 3 verse 20, it's because the world hates the light. You know, when we look back at Jesus, and I did this in a little study in preparation for our time this week, and I look back at Jesus and I ask this simple question. Who were the people that persecuted Jesus? Jesus was obviously persecuted, would you not agree? I, I, no doubt we, we, would, we could not ar argue that we will ever be persecuted to the level that Jesus was, but he was persecuted. But who were the people that persecuted him? Obviously, we would know that the Roman world persecuted him, the, which represented the pagan world. He, he stand in opposite, stood in opposition to the, to the world that lived outside of the scope of, of God's directive, of God's plan, of God's, God's commands. But the greater persecution did not come from the outside. The greater persecution came from the inside. Those of the, of the religious elite, the Pharisees and the Sadducees who, who assumed that they had a corner on the gospel, assumed they had a corner on the, on the things of God, on the, on the law of God, and it was, it was he, Jesus, that stood in opposition to those things. When we look at the scripture, however, we rec recognize that persecution didn't begin with Jesus. It actually began with the first family, and I'm not talking about the president and his wife. It began with the first family, with Adam and Eve. Remember that story with Cain murdering his brother Abel? Why did Cain kill him? John tells us in 1 John 3 verse 12, he, he, it was because Cain's deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. And Abel became the, the, the first martyr to be persecuted and killed for righteousness sake and ultimately has set a pattern for every one of us that would come after him. This pattern of opposition, harassment, and suffering runs throughout human history and our experience in the world today. A.W. Pink in one of his writings actually gives to us a, sort of a role of honor of those who have been persecuted for righteousness sake. 
And we could list a bunch of them, and I'm, I'm not going to this morning, but let me at least mention a few, Joseph being one of them. Remember Joseph? Joseph was, was loved by his family, right? Well, he was loved by his mom and dad, so much so that they gave him a coat of what? Many colors. But he was hated by his brothers. And, and you know, I thought about this story as I was sort of putting, to, putting this together over the last couple of weeks, just trying to put my thoughts down on how we would articulate this, this passage and ultimately how we would ultimately communicate, I believe, what God would have us to know. And the reality was, if you and I, 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 I asked this question about myself, if I was a fly on the wall in Joseph's day, you know, when we read Scripture, we read Scripture with the end in mind. We already know how it's going to turn out. We understand the, the, the parameters and, the, and, and all the things that's going to happen. But had we been a fly on the wall that day and the only thing we knew was what his brothers were able to see and recognize at that moment, his brothers thought Joseph was an arrogant punk. Really? And I wonder today, had we been there in an observing role, had we been there in a position where in that moment, looking at the life of Joseph, him receiving the coat of many colors and his dreams, would we have also seen Joseph from the perspective of him being an arrogant punk? I wonder, I wonder about that sometimes. Sometimes we get caught up in the, in the moment, transferring that forward into history when Jesus found himself heading to the cross and, and, the, and the edict was coming down and, and they were trying to decide whether they were going to take Barabbas and crucify Barabbas or crucify Jesus. The, the, the crowds that we found that day were the, was basically the church that gathered that day. It was the religious leaders who, who ultimately led that march, but the reality was the church was represented that day, as we would understand it, the religious world in that day. And because of the rage and the anger and the frustration of a few, the church was able to join in that emotional drive. And the church's words were along with the words of the, with, with, with the religious elite, and they said about Jesus, they, we need to what? crucify him they couldn't see the future they had no idea how it would all turn out that's why Peter would write in in Acts chapter 2 it was you that crucified Jesus they didn't physically crucify him but they had determined in their heart that he needed to be all they could sense and see was the emotional drive of the moment And so oftentimes in our perspective, in our world today, that's what we're able to see and that's what we're able to perceive. And and I believe this passage speaks to that issue. Not only do we see that uh, these two, but I wonder sometimes in this moment when we find ourselves in this place, what do we need to do? How do we respond? And I believe the Beatitudes would help us to be able to see and understand that and grasp that and ultimately help us to understand what our responsibility is in that moment. And we simply need to take the Beatitudes in a backwards manner when we're persecuted and when we find ourselves in in a position where we're not sure how to respond, we need to back up and understand that God's called us as individuals. He's called us to be peacemakers, right? Right? And when it's not within us to be a peacemaker, when it's not within us to be able to do that, God God says we need to move back one step further. We need to understand that God beyond that has moved to call us to a heart that's pure, to one that's that one that's beyond the spiritual stagnation of the moment, but, but one that's being purified by the Spirit of God. And when we realize that that is a little bit depleted in our life as well, we need to move back and understand that at the core, God's called us to be tender at heart, mercy-filled, forgiveness at heart. And when we cannot do that, what has God said to do? We need to get back to a place where we hunger and thirst for righteousness. And when it's beyond our ability to do that, we simply need to understand that God's called us to meekly submit to the will of God no matter the cost. And when we cannot do that, we need to humbly bring ourselves to a place where we mourn over our own sins and the effects of our own sins. And when we cannot do that, we need to come back to the place where it all begins. And understand that I am nothing 
And I have nothing apart from the grace of God that is poured out within me. Because we live in a world that finds itself oftentimes dealing with opposition, persecution, frustration, and all the rest that happens. But how does this passage help us to see truth, light, in the midst of what may be our current situations? I think we first need to clarify the issue. In your notes this morning, we're going to jump in there. We need to first clarify the issue. We need to be able to understand in the moment of time that what the text is saying to us. It's saying to us that what does it mean to be persecuted? Crude by nature. Re, re, speaking of those people who, per, per, uh, who, who are persisting in gross, unmannerly conduct, this passage is not talking about you. Because when things happen against you, it's just simply a natural reaction to the attitudes that you're giving off to others. If we find ourselves happening, happening to be one of those lazy individuals that really finds themselves always never getting to work on time, never working hard, criticizing others, always seeking to bend the rules, trying to find a way to do life our way, this passage is not talking about you either. Because you will get what you deserve. But what this passage is talking about is someone who's chosen to commit his, his life or her life to a position and, and following God with everything that's within them. And in the midst of it all, they're persecuted because of that commitment of life. Because they work hard, because they do things that are right, because they find themselves being willing to submit themselves and ultimately to love and cherish people as God has commanded us to. And when we do that, and many times misunderstood, we fi still find ourselves at times being misunderstood and persecuted. And this passage, I believe, gives to us some paradoxes that I think it would be helpful for us to understand as we sort of think about that issue of persecution. You know, paradox is something that Jesus oftentimes did. He talked about a paradox that seems to be a seemingly con contradictory statement that's really actually true. He, he makes statements like this in Matthew 6, 25. For whoever will save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will ultimately find it. He would say in Matthew 20, verse 16, the last will be first and the first will be. He would also say, it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. It's amazing when we look at this beatitude, there's some things that I think would be pertinent for us to understand as we wrap up and understand this eighth beatitude. This last beatitude, I think, stands as a test for everything that comes before it. Persecution is a mark of discipleship as, be, as much as being merciful is. It's the longest be beatitude because I think it's the hardest for us to embrace. It's the only beatitude with a command. And the command is to rejoice and be glad. Gee, thanks, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for this time of persecution, right? It's the only one that's given with an explanation, and we'll talk about that in a few moments. It's the only one that's repeated twice. The word blessed is used two times, as though Jesus is saying, you're doubly blessed when you're persecuted. And it's the only, only beatitude that addresses you and I on a personal level. The tense changes from verse 10, blessed are those who are persecuted, to verse 11, blessed are you. When people speak evil against you. The problem is with this beatitude, with this matter, with this piece of information, that with this part of life that's at hand is every one of us like to be liked. And we often find ourselves in those moments of life when we find ourselves underneath the throes of this that we don't respond very well in the moment. 
So let me give you, I can, if I can, three paradoxes that this passage speaks to us. First of all, as already on your, on your screen this morning, persecution is a given. Matthew 5 and verse 10 says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. The word righteousness has to be is living the straight way of following Christ. Don't, John Stott says it this way, should, we should not be surprised if, 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 if the world brings hostility against us. Rather be surprised when it doesn't. Why? John 15 verse 20 says, if they persecuted me, Jesus said, they will also persecute you. John 16 verse 33, in this world you will have trouble. Matthew 24 verse verse 9, then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death and you'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. 2 Timothy 3 verse 12, indeed all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Philippians 1 29, for it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him but also given the privilege to suffer for his sake. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trials when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. So we need to understand that persecution is a given. That as a follower of Christ, that's something that we should expect. Why? Two, th- two statements that you don't need to fill in the blank, but I want to make sure it's something to ponder, some thinking about, because this passage alludes to both of these. First of all, because of the life we live, verse 10 says it this way, those who are persecuted because of righteousness, because of our commitment to live right. And verse 11, because of the Lord we love, Jesus says you'll be persecuted, people insult you, say all kinds of ugly things about you because of me of your relationship with me. So persecution is a given for us as followers of Christ. Secondly, we need to know persecution is also a gift. Thank you, Jesus, right? Verse 11 says, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. He changes the the pronoun here from those to personalizing the aspect to you. And he he identifies at least three particular areas that many times persecution comes by way of into our life. By verbal assaults, the word revile means to chide, to taunt, or to defame, or to destroy a character. Matthew 27 verse 39 says this way, tells people that, that hurled insults at Jesus and as Jesus walked by, they shook their heads in disapproval. The word persecute there actually means, it, it speaks of a physical ta- attack. That means, it literally means to chase away or to pursue with hostile intent or to be hunted down as an animal. And the word false, the word utter all kinds of evil against you is actually about false accusations, saying things incorrectly or lying about yourself or your character. Psalm 35 verse 11 says, false witnesses did rise up and they laid to my charge things that I knew not of. And we wonder sometimes why this happens. What motivates, drives people to that. Jim Aylett said it this way, the great martyred missionary. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. While most of us will never face the persecution like Jim Elliot of losing his life, or, or maybe many others as we look back to the stories of history and of the lives of the disciples, every one of the disciples lost their life or gave their life as a ransom because of their commitment to follow Jesus Christ. The reality is it becomes for us a matter that we will encounter, and it is a gift to us. Thirdly, Persecution ought to bring gladness to us. Here's the command, verse 12, rejoice and be glad. The word be glad is a command and it literally means to leap forth with exuberant gladness, to jump with exceeding excitement. Praise the Lord! Gee, thank you! Jesus said it this way in Luke 6, 23 on this same passage, rejoice in that day and leap for joy. 
God gives us an opportunity in this journey not to be excited or be joyful regarding the, the things that we're encountering, but be rejoice and be glad in the results or the fruit of what God is doing through the difficulties that we face. We look in this world and we wonder why. Jesus gives us a little insight into that as well in Luke 12, 48. He says, to everyone to whom much is given, of him much will be required. And from him to whom they entrusted much, they will demand the more. You know, we wonder sometimes in this journey as we may be an observer, maybe like I mentioned earlier on about Joseph, maybe being a fly on the wall, sometimes we see things happen around us. What should be our response? Many times we find ourselves sort of setting back and being passive. It's not mine to get involved with. But as a follower of Christ, we need to do something, right? I remember a visit that we had a few years ago and a little girl that was, we were in a restaurant and I was with a friend of mine and we were in a restaurant uh, down in North Carolina, and I, there was a little girl that was there that, with a man that just obviously didn't seem to be right. She was uncomfortable. She was in a place that, ah, what do you do? They just seem wrong. They're just something just didn't, you've been there maybe, your spirit's just unsettled. What do you do in a moment like that? Well, I did what I was supposed to do, I think. I stepped up and I asked the family, I said, is there anything that I can help you with? You seem unsettled today. Of course, the gentleman got up, stood to his feet, and said, leave us alone. There's nothing that you can do. And he grabbed the little girl and they walked out of the restaurant. And I often prayed and wondered what happened that day. Uh, there was nothing that was obvious but for me to sit back and do nothing would have been wrong. But we have to do something, right? Is it not our responsibility as followers of Christ to act? To do something? When we see things that are obviously wrong. I think the scripture would carry on a little bit further because I think this passage helps us to understand that there's a price to be paid and we need to be careful to be willing to pay that price. As we fall into the being on the receiving end of that persecution that comes, we oftentimes find ourselves sometimes spiraling down into what we would perceive as a pit. None of us want to be in that place. But what is our responsibility? How, what, what are we to do? How are we to, to act in, in this environment? I think, number one, we need to commit to living a consistent Christian life. You know, one of the verses that I have committed to memory and, and has been sort of a life verse for me for many, many years now is a verse in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12. It says this. Live in such a way that when people speak all manner of evil against you, they will be proven wrong by the way you live your life. At the end of the day, you, can't, you and I cannot control what other people will say. But what you and I can do is we can choose to live a life that's above reproach. That somewhere along the line, those who speak evil against us will be proven wrong because they simply are not right. Because of the way we've choose, chosen to live our lives. We need to commit to live a consistent Christian life. I think secondly, we need to defend what's right. And stand against what's wrong. You know, we've got a, we've got a responsibility. And at times we, we may want to cower. We may want to find our way sort of to cower down and say it's, you know, okay, whatever it is. But there's times we just need to stand up for what's right. And there's times we need to stand up against what's wrong. We'll talk more about this in the weeks to come. And I, you know, you've been here long enough to know that I don't deal with politics a lot. But there's a couple of matters that I believe that's in the election this coming month, this coming months that you're going to hear more about. And one of them is an amendment for the abortion matter that we're dealing with. 
our state has been, became, become one of the strongest states, I suppose, in sort of keep stopping abortion with a six-week ban. There's an effort that's, been, there's the effort that's been brought before Congress to change our Constitution, and that wording seems to be so Im- ambiguous. Do you realize the ambiguity of the, of the language is intentional? And that the intentional ambiguity of the language actually gives the right for abortions to take place all the way up to the point of birth. And if we, as a state, pass that, we will be one of the most liberal states in our country with its abortion, with its abortion freedoms. I believe there's a time for us as a church family to stand up against what's right and stand against what's wrong. And we need to make sure that we're willing to do that, even if it costs us something in the journey. There's a third thing that I think we need to do as we think about this persecution, is we've got to respond in a godly fashion. You know, character is demonstrated in difficult times. Characters developed sometimes in those difficult times, but every time character will be revealed. And when you see consequences and you see difficulties that are around us, what you're going to see is you're going to see a display of the character of the individuals that's at place. It's okay to test that character. It's okay to see what's out there. Because God has called you and I as individuals, as followers of Jesus Christ, even in the midst of the most difficult persecution to live godly in Christ Jesus. To display a godly character in the midst of whatever, whatever life we face in life. So, how do we apply what we've talked about today? I'm going to ask you, if you will, to follow with me to three passages of Scripture. The one being in Matthew 5, the first one will be in Matthew chapter 5, and I'd ask you, if you would, to join me down to the end of Matthew, in Matthew 5, verse 43. I think if we're going to find ourselves in those moments when when persecution may come our way, what is your and my responsibility? Number one, our greatest responsibility is to pray. Pray for yourself and to pray for those who oppose you. Matthew 5 verse 43, Jesus gives to us one of these statements and we'll get here in weeks, to, in months to come actually. Matthew 5 43 says, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That's what the law said. That was what the law was given to state. But Jesus said, I've come to elevate the law. I've I've come to call you as a follower of Jesus Christ to step above the law, to live a life that's above what the law would require. And I'm calling you to love your enemies and to pray for those who persecute you. Now here's what we want to do. We want to read the Psalms. And we want to read the purgatory Psalms particularly. As David said, Lord, sick them. And we want to say, Lord, you have your way. You go ahead. I'll stand on the sidelines and clap. But that's not what God's asked us to do. God's asked us to pray for the benefit and the blessing of those who persecute us. The reality is, is so many times in life when someone comes against us, when somebody slaps you as a, as, a, as a human response, what are we going to do? Oh, don't put on your spiritual faces today. We're going to slap back. If somebody if, hurls an insult at you, what are we going to do? We're going to respond in like manner. And Jesus said, if we're going to live godly in Christ Jesus, if the Beatitudes have any root in our life, if the the pursuit of righteousness has any fruit in our life, we're going to have to come to the place that I no longer hurl insults back. I simply choose to pray. What did Jesus do when he was accused? Isaiah even prophesied it 700 years earlier. He, He opened not his mouth. Why? He didn't need to defend himself. And if we choose to live a life that's above reproach, we don't need to defend ourselves either. We simply need to pray. 
Pray for those who oppose us. Secondly, I'm going to ask you if you would to turn with me to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. I do appreciate the three Bibles that's open and pages are turning. Everybody else has a tablet. I'm sure that that page turning app does not work in your Bible, in your app, but Jesus said not only are we to pray for those who oppose us, we also need to bless them in the name of the Lord. Romans 12, starting in verse 3. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself or herself more highly than he or she ought to think, but to think of yourself with sober judgment. To be honest with yourself and about yourself. Measuring yourself by the faith that God has given to you. And if we're able to do that, then we're able to come to a place and realize that everything that we have, everything that we are, is, is a gift from Almighty God. And therefore, what do I have to defend other than simply to take the blessing that has been poured into my life and to seek to share it on behalf of others? Verse 14 of Romans 12, bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Rather pray that God will bless them. Be happy with those who are happy. Weep for those who weep. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. And don't think you know it all because we don't. Pray. Bless. Last verse I'll ask you to go to is Romans chapter 5. And if we're going to live godly in Christ Jesus, we're going to pray for those who oppose us. We're going to bless them in the name of the Lord. And we're going to endure persecution patiently knowing that the Lord is in control of even the tiniest circumstances of life. Chapter 5 of Romans is one of my favorite passages of Scripture. I love this. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, Declared righteous. As a result of that, now we have peace. What does it next say? Thank you. Three people have your Bibles open. Peace what? With God. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have obtained access by faith. Listen to that. Into his grace in which we stand. The word stand there is, 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 the, is the idea of standing with a leaning forward, leaning forward even into the opposition that may be coming our way, where we now stand and have confidence and joyful looking forward to sharing in God's glory one day. Therefore, verse 3, we can... Whew, rejoice. Two, when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they, the problems and trials, help to develop endurance. And endurance is developing the strength of character. And the strength of character is strengthening our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will never disappoint us. And if somewhere along the line, realizing that we have a place of standing in God's grace, realizing that we have the benefit all of God's blessing, that ultimately we have peace with God, if that's not enough to keep us going, to keep us enduring, to recognize in the midst of struggles that a man who puts his hand to the plow and looks back in times of trouble is not fit for the kingdom of heaven, if it's not enough to keep us going, just look down at verse 11. We have an opportunity now to rejoice in this wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made you and I a friend of God. Wow. Here's what I know about 
life. You and I never will have an opportunity to determine the circumstances that oftentimes come against us. But we have the opportunity and the responsibility to respond appropriately to those circumstances. And by the grace of God that has been poured into your life and my life as a follower of Jesus Christ, if you know Christ as your Savior, we have the strength, the ability with the Spirit living in us to do what otherwise we could never have done, to be able to live out faith in the midst of difficulty in such a way that God will be glorified. And you know, the scripture would go on and we're going to be here next week. Verse 13 of chapter 5, God says to us, we've been called to be salt in this world. And we've been called, verse 14 and 15, to be light to this world. I want you to ponder this one thing with me because the scripture, its order is not by accident or coincidence. You and I will never be salt unless we first learn the Beatitudes and have got that Beatitude part worked out. If God's not at work on the inside of us, we'll never be able to display a godly character to the outside world. We'll never be a light to a world in darkness that ne desperately needs to see something uniquely different, some hope that's beyond what they can see in the world. We'll never be able to display light unless the Beatitudes has taken root in our life. We've been able to pursue righteousness and the fruit of that righteousness is born out in our lives. Because God's called you and I to do something that's impossible for us to do but what the Spirit of God living in you has now empowered you to do what otherwise you could not do. Would you stand with us for prayer, please? Father, we bless you today and we thank you so much for the privilege that we have with your word to look therein and to recognize that life is not always easy. And every one of us, myself included, blow it more times than we would like to admit, but I'm so grateful. Karen and I this morning were, were just singing the little children's chorus. God's not finished with me yet. I'm so grateful he's not. That he's still working in every one of our lives. The little chorus goes, don't judge me yet because God's not finished. <laughs> but God, I pray that we may not be satisfied where we are. But God, you'll continue to draw us back to this inner working of your spirit that we might understand our place of standing has nothing to do with our own merit. We're, we're empty. We have nothing to bring to the table. But by your grace, you have brought us into relationship. You've challenged us to pursue righteousness, to hunger and thirst after it. And you've promised us, if we will, there'll be fruit that's born into our life that resembles the character of the Almighty. God, do in us what we cannot do for ourselves. And I pray for that one this morning that may be here in our midst that's never met you as their personal Savior. And God, today, maybe you're tugging at their heart's door to say, today's your day. You need to open up your heart. Jesus said, I love you, and I died for you. I gave my life to pay for your sin debt. And today may need to be your day to open up your heart and invite Jesus to come in. I'll remain at the front for just a few moments. If there's decisions to be made, the altar needs to be opened today. You need to come and pray. This is our time to do business with God and his word. We love you, Lord. Thank you for loving us. Bless us even as we worship today, we pray in Jesus' name.